Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our weekly webinars on caregiving during the time of COVID. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by two great presenters who have lots of experience working with caregivers and being a caregiver themselves. There will be a Q&A session during the second half of this webinar, so please type in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll hand it over to our presenters, Sarah Delaney and Pam Roberts. Thank you, Manor, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Again, we're going to be talking about in-home activities while sheltering in place. And this can be a challenge for all of us, whether we have cognitive impairment or not. My name is Sarah Delaney, and I'm a clinical nurse specialist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. I've worked in in-home care, long-term care settings, and I've been at the Memory and Aging Center since about 2014. I feel really lucky to work with the families, um, particularly the caregivers caring for people with dementia. And I'm Pam Roberts, and my Husband traveled a 12 year journey with Alzheimer's. He was diagnosed at UCSF um, initially and remained a client there for the 12 years. And we were fortunate that I was able to take care of him from home and I'm looking forward to Sarah's presentation. Thank you. Great, so many of us might be wondering what are we supposed to do while we're stuck home all day, every day, going on week three now. I was talking to a caregiver the other day that gave some great advice, I think, for all of us and including people with cognitive impairment to help reduce stress that is in our home because we know stress is contagious. So sticking with a routine, taking one day at a time, doing our best, being gentle with ourselves, and prioritizing connecting with others. So that's just some general advice that I think we can all benefit from following. In thinking about this topic, I was inspired by a program called Engage, which is a treatment for late life depression. It's being studied by Alex Opolis and colleagues at Cornell. And the focus is on doing activities that help affect our mood and change the neurochemicals in our brain to help us feel better. So part of the focus is on activities that give us a sense of reward, activities that help us regulate our emotions, and activities that help us let go of thoughts that are really negative and can affect our mood. I was also thinking um, about activities that might refresh our energy and give us a, more strength to get through this as it lasts, you know, this rest of this next month. And also that we know one of the best ways to deal with stress is social support, especially with prolonged chronic stressors like caregiving for someone with a really lengthy disease or being stuck at home for prolonged periods of time. When I talk about rewarding activities, I'm thinking about things that give us a sense of purpose and accomplishment. So for a lot of us, work gives us a sense of purpose and accomplishment. Helping others is certainly um, a sense, gives us a sense of help of purpose and accomplishment. So in some ways, being a caregiver could be protective. We can also think about ways that we can help the person with cognitive impairment help us. For example, I cared for a woman who had cognitive impairment. She wasn't able to talk. She wasn't able to do a lot, but she could color pictures with crayons. And we would use those pictures to make cards to send to people. So she could be a part of making something for someone. She was also really good at giving back rubs. So that was another way that she could help us. So trying to find a way for mutual support. I am finding that household projects and chores are give me a sense of immediate satisfaction and reward my work and sometimes you know it's more of a long-term reward and 
sweeping the floor and, and seeing a clean floor afterward or doing the dishes and seeing clean counters afterward is a much more immediate sense of reward. I think people with dementia and cognitive impairment can also contribute, whether it's picking up leaves in the backyard, sweeping the floor, helping fold clothes, maybe sorting or drying dishes. They might need some help and they might not do things perfectly, but finding ways to help incorporate them in household chores can give them that sense of reward. Also home improvement projects, and this doesn't have to be elaborate remodeling. It can be moving some furniture around, rearranging curtains or you know, pictures on the, on the wall, sorting books, sorting clothes, cleaning out closets. Uh, so thinking about different home improvement projects that we might be able to do together. Cooking and baking is certainly something I enjoy and find therapeutic. And we can also find ways to help incorporate, maybe someone can help peel potatoes or stir things, or if we measure ingredients and they can pour them into the bowl. Gardening is certainly a rewarding activity for a lot of people. I don't have space to garden myself, but I enjoy uh, keeping, trying to keep houseplants alive. And many people, according to social media, have been fostering pets if they didn't already have a pet. Certainly caring for and nurturing a pet can be rewarding. Creative art projects. We may not think of ourselves as creative or artists, However, these can be rewarding. And again, we have that, you know, something to show for it after coloring a picture or taking a photograph. I think a way to increase that sense of a reward is letting other people know. So if you do something that you find rewarding, like I baked muffins and I took a picture of them and I sent it to my family or I see friends on Facebook or social media who are uh, doing different activities, painting with watercolors, um, arranging mandalas with things they find in nature. And if you take a picture of it and share it with people, that can give even more of a boost for our mood and help give other people ideas of what they might be able to do. In thinking about art projects, I was thinking not all of us have art supplies at home and may not have access to art supplies. So thinking of things to do with found objects. If you collect rocks and you can organize them in a pattern and take a picture of it, or many of us might have recyclables like toilet paper rolls, things like tape, and we can make sculptures together. So we don't necessarily have to be artists to be creative. Things like makeup or dress up and taking pictures, doing things like that can also be creative. Simple puzzles, Springbok makes some memory puzzles that are 36 piece and they come in themes that are more adult and less childlike that can be a way to something to work on together and learning a new skill. So for some of us that might be something more ambitious like learning a new language to, to try to practice or learn. We can also learn how to sing a new song on karaoke or learn some exercises together. So learning a new skill doesn't necessarily have to be really ambitious to be rewarding. M many of us are needing ways to help cope with heightened and prolonged stress. So we want to help ease tension and emotional arousal in our minds and in our bodies. Certainly mindful awareness, meditation, deep breathing for people who are religious, religious rituals, prayer, mantras. One that I did a Zen caregiving project training and they introduced us to the metta meditation, which is may I be happy, may I be well, may I be safe, may I be peaceful, may I be at ease. And then you extend that. So may you be happy, may you be well, may you be safe, may you be peaceful and at ease. And you just extend that to people across the world. And it's, for me, a relaxing thing to repeat. And I encourage people to use whatever sort of repetitive and reassuring prayer or mantra that 
might help them relax their stress and tension. Nature certainly is therapeutic in this area. Some of us don't have access to being able to walk in nature currently. We might be able to go on a scenic drive or even sit next to a window and look at the sky or birds, squirrels, notice the weather. And if that's not available, there are certainly lots of videos on television or YouTube that can, where we can experience nature virtually. Drinking tea or something else that you enjoy in a, in a mindful way, noticing the flavor, noticing how it helps your, warm your body can be a way to relax. And imagining a different reality, I think this can go both ways. Um, we can imagine being somewhere more pleasant, maybe somewhere where we've taken vacation in the past and even look at pictures and have this be a reminiscing activity. We can also imagine being somewhere more distressing and be grateful that we are in a place that is relatively safe. Warm showers or baths are good ways to ease tension. Things like massage, going for a walk, getting fresh air. Affection, if you're quarantined with another person and they respond well to physical affection like hugs, holding hands, cuddling with a pet. If we don't have another person to be affectionate or a pet to be affectionate with, things like stuffed animals, wrapping up in a soft blanket, even weight in blankets can give us a sense of help ease the tension in the body. And certainly listening to music, and I think there are a variety of ways to do that. Right now, there are lots of live streaming, you know, if you prefer jazz or opera or country music, and you use the internet to search and find live stream concerts that can also be a way to connect with a community in a virtual way. And for me, certainly eating chocolate is helpful for stress relief. A lot of us are probably relying on distracting activities. And one of the things that I found useful about distracting activities is that it distracts my attention from these stressful news that we hear about the coronavirus and it can distract us from our own worries and fears it can also be entertaining and amusing. So I think there's a, an important role for distracting activities. These are things that might be kind of more superficial and amusing and can just be a way to pass the time. Um, manicures, playing with hairstyles, Dressing up, again, I think these are the kinds of things that might be really fun to do and take pictures or do a video call. Just looking at magazines, coloring books, talking about trivia, telling jokes, reading books, even if a person with cognitive impairment, if they were someone who read a lot in the past, they might enjoy holding a book and reading some words on the page, even if they may not comprehend everything. Singing karaoke or just singing songs from that we remember or maybe grew up with is a fun way to laugh in my experience. And simple games, just the other day, I played dominoes with a friend and it was really, I, I personally have been watching more TV than I usually watch and it was, I did notice that it felt different after playing dominoes that it felt like I was using a different part of my brain. There are digital games. If we don't have people who are able to play games with us, we certainly know people who play a lot of solitaire and there are even video games that people might enjoy like Microsoft Flight Simulator which simulates the experience of flying an airplane. Again, I, I don't wanna downplay that television can be really entertaining. So classic movies, sitcoms, things that we enjoyed watching in the past that might also bring up reminiscing 
if someone is really into sports, a lot of the, you know, the NFL or the NBA, they have their showing classic games that can be a way for people to experience sports when there aren't live sports going on, cooking or home improvement shows. There are live animal cameras where you can see animals in the wild. I heard today there are virtual safaris where you can experience safaris through video. And so I think television can be passive and entertaining and we can also make it more engaging and more of a shared experience if we get a little bit creative with it. There are also virtual museum tours through Google Arts and Culture. Many of the big opera and symphony companies that have had to cancel their seasons are offering live stream opera and symphony online as well as open classes or lectures. So this might be something that the a caregiver could do or, or do with someone um, with cognitive impairment who, who might participate in a more passive way. So for refreshing activities, these are things that help renew our strength and energy. And I think these are really important when we're dealing with prolonged stress. Exercise is really important and more difficult to accomplish when we have to shelter in place. So there are lots of exercise videos that are now available free. A couple of the ones that I've found that I thought looked more appealing are the silver sneakers videos or the NIH go for life videos. They're pretty simple, do it at home exercises and the videos are pretty high quality. There are, there are lots of other options out there, even just putting on music and, and dancing or doing you know, sit to stand exercises. Whenever you get up from a chair, do a couple of extra sit and stands to keep your leg strength and just some basic stretches. Again, with creative projects, I think that we already discussed, but can also help revive energy and spiritual practices or rituals, whether it's being in nature or honoring religious traditions, such as cedar meals today for Passover. I think that can really help renew our strength. And if we don't have spiritual or religious practices, then just reflecting on our goals and values and how what we're doing is a part of something that's bigger than just us. And it's affecting the health and wellness of the, the broader community. When we're spending so much time with someone alone, and uh, it's important to remember what are the things that can help us deepen our relationships. So things like reminiscing about memories that you've shared, telling stories that you might not have told your children, for example, that they might appreciate hearing, and observing and finding meaning in the more mundane things in life. So food preferences or family recipes, silly things that people might say, for example, my dad, if we did something that he didn't like when we were growing up, he would say, we owed him five bucks and it makes no sense to anybody else, but it's something funny that my siblings and I uh, relate to. And thinking about recording meaningful moments on video, one of the things that I treasure, my uncle is in the more advanced stage of dementia right now. And when he was in the moderate stage, we were spending an afternoon together. We were eating strawberries and they were delicious in season strawberries. And so I videotaped him talking about the strawberry and it was very simple, but I actually really am glad that I have that now to remember. When we're all dealing with more stress and may not always act in ways that are our best selves, it's important to apologize. And also to let things go when other people do things that get on our nerves. And then this concept of using love languages, this is part of you know, what's the key to healthy relationships according to Gary Chapman. So being proactive about giving people compliments, appreciating people when they do something nice for us, finding ways to just be more affectionate, 
have more quality time together and be good to each other. Connecting remotely is certainly something we're all doing more than we've ever done, probably. Certainly through phone calls and texts for those who might wanna have more group connection. There's Covia's Well Connected, which are, is basically like a senior center without walls concept. They do armchair travel. They have different classes that can be joined by phone. There are also uh, a number of virtual support groups through different organizations like the Alzheimer's Association, for example. I've always enjoyed sending letters and postcards, and I think this is also an important way to connect when it might not be an appropriate time to call or connect with someone virtually. And social media like Facebook, Instagram, Nextdoor, and WhatsApp are also, I think, key ways to stay connected and I think bring some positivity um, to other people. Video calls through Skype or Google Duo, the Amazon Alexa Show, these are technologies that have made video calling a lot easier. And when we do video calls, thinking about how to get the most out of it. If we're calling someone with dementia who might not be able to follow it or engage in a conversation as well, thinking about maybe singing a song when we call or doing something more interactive like a show and tell, um, you know, having grandchildren put on a show or uh, find, ha planning a conversation around a shared memory or a way to have a topic of conversation. And for those of us who are at home with our loved ones, trying to do it all, just remember that it's okay to pace yourself and that when people have dementia, there are a lot of barriers to engagement. We might just celebrate getting through the activities that we have to do, like basic grooming and getting meals and getting through the day any way that we can find ways to connect through those activities of daily living, I think will lighten the mood and make things better for everyone. And if we are gonna try to do some of these more creative activities, just acknowledging that doing something for five to 15 minutes might be a realistic goal that people can have a shortened attention span and expecting someone to engage in an activity for longer than that might be unrealistic. So now I'm going to ask that our participants type in their own tips and ideas. We have some pictures here that uh, represent activities that families that we've worked with have found useful. So Amazon Alexa show or video calling. We had a woman who was very religious and wasn't able to read the Bible anymore. She really enjoyed listening to the Bible on this Wonder Bible. There are certainly audiobooks that also you can get the Bible on audiobook, but she liked carrying this, this Wonder Bible around, and it was pretty simple and easy for her to use. For people who like stuffed animals, they might also get enjoyment out of animated or robot stuffed animals, like this Joy for All dog down at the bottom. And at, like I mentioned simple puzzles, and here's an example of someone engaging with a simple puzzle that's pretty high contrast to make it easier for them to see. And I'm gonna... so now we're going to move on and hear Pam's story. One of the things I really like about hearing Pam's story, I've heard it several times now, is that she's really able to articulate ways to help someone over the course of their disease with activities of daily living. And I think for some of us, that might be the most challenging part of the day. And so I hope that we're all able to learn something from her experience and her story. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Pam Roberts, my husband, Dave, traveled a 12 year journey with Alzheimer's and he died in May of 2015. Dave was diagnosed in 2003 at UCSF with mild cognitive impairment, MCI, and he was started on Aricept and Namenda. 
He was retired and I was still working in San Francisco. Six years later in 2009, he graduated to Alzheimer's. The first six years of the 12 years, he was still pretty functional. He was managing the activities of daily living with the typical challenges of MCI of losing glasses, wallet, the car and parking lots, frustration trying to fix things. In the middle of the 12 years, I moved my work to home to be more on the spot for helping as needed. I needed to be his coach. And we adopted a rescue dog who became Dave's constant companion. I took classes and attended support groups that helped to prepare me for the changes in communication and in activities of daily living. And I attended several conferences that reinforced, that reinforced what I was learning. When he graduated to Alzheimer's and had to stop driving, I made the decision to start taking him out for three hours every afternoon with our dog in order to continue our hiking and our errands. And we started stopping every afternoon for ice cream. We were able to keep up that routine, but with shorter and shorter walks until about the last 10 weeks of his life. During the second six years, the disease progression was more evident with more and more challenges in the activities of daily living. Based on the classes and conferences, I coached myself to slow down my speech and to really moderate my tone. I had to learn to slow down my movements around Dave, to not feel rushed, to not transfer a sense of rushing or pressure. I had to learn, and it took me a long time to learn, to not offer help until Dave asked for help. I might offer once, but seeing rejection, I learned to walk away and wait or cycle back a bit later, but still wait until he asked for help with zipping up his jeans or buckling his belt or buttoning his shirt or tying his shoes. I learned to accept that he was going backwards in time from an adult to a toddler. And I needed to creatively help him get through his daily life. I needed to coach him through his day. I made an effort to not worry about what was not working and to work with what was still working, to be happy and grateful for what was still working and to not take his behavior personally. I childproofed the house and left surfaces clean to avoid the potential of certain things being thrown or broken. I worked to never say no or not and to think of how to change the situation or to redirect. I learned to not correct his stories. When they were quite unreal, I tried to engage saying, tell me more, then gradually redirect or change the subject. If he was persistent about doing something, something that was impossible for us, like go to Mexico or go to Europe, I would say, okay, all right, yes, I agree. I'll, I'll work on that later this afternoon or tomorrow. I had to learn to tolerate compulsions and not say, no, don't do that, such as on our hikes and walks when Dave would stop to pick up feathers, every feather, and then it was pine cones, and then it was rocks, and I learned to carry a plastic bag to hold everything. We had to give up window shopping and browsing in stores since he wanted to buy things we did, we did not need and could not afford, like cameras and paintings and bikes. Social intelligence lasted a long time, even in the moderate to later stages, even in aphasia. When seeing someone he knew, like a doctor, a dentist, a vet, he would light up and banter. Maybe once a month, someone we knew really well might come for dinner and we would sit at the dining room table and Dave would light up and follow the conversation and engage now and then with laughing and even making a pun until after about 40 minutes, he would just hit a wall. He would get up without saying anything and go back to his room to lie down. The next day, he would be totally exhausted from the social effort the evening before and sleep and nap much more than usual, which was normally a lot. To reduce the trauma of changing clothes at night, I let him sleep in his shirt and t-shirt and underpants and socks. In the morning, while he was sitting on the toilet, I would change his underpants. Back in his bedroom, I had other clothes laid out on the bed and ready to use. While he was sitting on the bed, I would put on clean socks and put his feet and legs into the jeans. I had his clean shirt 
buttoned with a clean t-shirt inside. I would remove the old buttoned shirt and t-shirt as one unit over his head and immediately get his arms through the clean buttoned shirt t-shirt combination and put them over his head as one unit. I had a zip up cardigan sweater to put on if he seemed cold. Then I put his shoes on his feet. As he stood, I would quickly pull up his jeans, tuck in his shirt and zip up his pants. For a long time, toileting was okay. When he started missing the toilet bowl, he self-selected to sit on the toilet for all his business. Wiping became a challenge, so I kept baby wipes handy to help him. And when I realized how sensitive he was becoming to hot and cold, I bought a baby wipe heater. At night, I left lights on in the hall and in the bathroom. And for a long time, he would get up to go to the toilet by himself. I slept in a room with an adjoining wall and was able to hear him. In the morning, sometimes I would find him cold because he had not pulled the covers back over himself after going back to bed. And then I started to help him get back into bed at night. Part of his nighttime pattern was to get something to eat out of the refrigerator, so I started fixing a snack for him and left it on the counter next to the refrigerator. As things progressed, I needed to help him get to the toilet, get to his snack, back into bed during the night. And if there had been any kind of accident, I would change his diaper pants while he was sitting on the toilet and clean up with warm baby wipes as fast as I could. Dave was able to take his own shower without much help for a long time. Then I needed to start coaxing him and to accept that showering would become less frequent. When coaxing no longer worked, I started a new strategy by coming into the bathroom when he was sitting on the toilet, starting to run the shower water to warm up the room and the shower floor and say something like, since we're already here and the water's warm, how about taking a shower? And while he was still sitting on the toilet, I would work quickly to take off his socks and jeans and underwear. I would leave his shirt on until he was closer to the shower. I added extra rugs to the floor so his feet would not be on the cold tile. I would be by the shower talking about the chance to take a shower and then would work as smoothly as possible to take his shirt and t-shirt off over his head as one unit then quickly help him step into the shower where the tub floor was warm. Initially he could shower and soap himself then eventually I needed to reach in to do that for him. When rinsing, I asked him to stand with the warm water flowing over him while I retrieved the two warm towels from the dryer. I would wrap him in the warm towels, walk him to his bedroom where I had previously laid out all the clean clothes for the speed dressing I described earlier. Eventually, he really started objecting and getting angry in the shower until I finally realized that no matter how hard I tried to make it a warm experience, the instant the water stops, Evaporation starts immediately and it was really cold for him before I could get the towels around him. I then graduated to rinseless soap to give a quick sponge bath, which I would do in the laundry room by turning up the heat to 80 degrees. And with the rinseless soap on a hot washcloth from the microwave, and while Dave was fully dressed, I would undo enough shirt buttons to reach in under his t-shirt to wash his torso and arms and underarms, and then quickly pull down his jeans and underpants to his ankles, and quickly wash his lower half. I needed to accomplish all this in a flash to be done and out of the laundry room just as he was starting to really object. Sometimes I would do the upper half one day and the lower half another day. Temper tantrums, kicking, hitting, swearing. Dave did all these things at some point, when I couldn't figure out what was causing it and change things for him, I learned to back off, to stay out of his reach, to go outside and walk around the house, and to stay out of his sight for a while. After an episode, he would frequently stay in his room for a short time or a long time, and I would stay out of his sight until he asked for help with something. And sometimes at that point, he would look at me and say he was sorry. Things I learned that triggered aggravation and temper bursts, and this is not an exhaustive list, were things that he could not express. Even before aphasia, he could not express that he was too hot or too cold or wet and cold, 
that he was tired or hungry or needed a bathroom or that he had some pain or felt sick. Also, waiting in a doctor's office or in the emergency room was another trigger. His doctors became sensitive and learned to not make him wait, but the emergency room was always a problem. Things I learned that made his dementia suddenly worse included UTI, tinnitus vertigo, any amount, even a mild amount of anesthesia. And although the sudden worsening was temporary, it definitely required 24-7 attention. In a hospital, I was always fearful that he would be left alone and totally confused by the staff. So I stayed 24-7 in any of those situations. Things I learned to mitigate aggravation, in addition to slowing my speech and moderating my tone, were to talk through what I was going to do and while I was doing it. The speed dressing, the toileting, the showering. I learned to let him know in advance I was going to touch him, especially his feet. On a brighter note, I was his interpreter, helping other people understand him and helping him to understand other people, including interpreting TV programs we had always watched together. And when there was 40s and 50s and 60s music playing, he would get up and we would dance in front of the TV. Even in aphasia, I could always tell when he wanted to talk about his high school buddies, and I would get out his yearbook to look at together. Almost every day, at one point, even in aphasia, he would say, thank you, or I love you. And in aphasia, he said it with his eyes. In closing, behavior is communication. I was not always good at deciphering what his behavior was communicating, but in my experience, when things did calm down, eye contact remained, even in aphasia, eye contact remained the avenue for communication and connection, along with silence and just being there. A final thought, first and foremost, approach with non-threatening attention and connection, and all the while remembering something that does not work right now might work in 20 minutes, or in an hour, or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. So just reviewing the things that we talked about, doing your best, being gentle with yourself, considering activities that might be rewarding, relaxing, distracting, refreshing, and connecting. When you're helping with Activities of daily living, you want to observe and try to support the person to do what they can, adapt as they need more help, and simplify, and explore ways that behavior is communication. There's a lot of resources. This first one, Purposeful Activities for People with Dementia, basically teaches the concept of Montessori activities. It's from the Alzheimer's Association or the equivalent of the Alzheimer's Association in Australia. They have some great videos for tips for helping people help with household chores and purposeful activities. Greater Good in Action Practices, these are worksheets that give instructions for doing different mindfulness and stress and coping activities. Time Slips Creative Storytelling is something that's been done in a lot of long-term care facilities. It's basically using pictures and images to help people with cognitive impairment collaboratively tell engaging stories. This discount school supply is an art supply company that will ship art supplies. So if they also have some free craft ideas if your person might like to do art. These are the sit and be fit and go for life exercise videos. These are free fact slides if you want to talk about trivia. Explore.org has live animal cameras. These are domestic and wild animals. So you can look at animals from around the world. Mindful Music Moments is from the Cleveland Orchestra. This is arts and culture from Google if you want a taste of art. This is a karaoke playlist. There's also on our website, the memory.ucsf.edu slash COVID has access or a list of other resources with activity ideas. I also wanted to mention there are a lot of organizations like the Alzheimer's Association, 
Vanessa Sousa is coordinating an art class webinar designed for people with cognitive impairment. The Zen Caregiving Project has some caregiving webinars, so there's a growing number of these online resources available. And now we will take questions or comments. Great. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your creative ideas. And thank you, Pam, um, for your beautiful story. Um, again, if you have questions, please type them in in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, one of the questions we have here is about a patient with frontotemporal dementia who's been very outdoorsy, um, used to enjoy going to the gym and doing physical activities like running and biking. Um, his family's struggling um, because they've tried exercising at home and other activities um, while this lockdown is going on and he doesn't seem to engage in them. Do you have any ideas on how to help? I do wonder if they might do well with a recumbent bike, like an indoor recumbent bike, or even doing virtual like personal training at home with home gym equipment, weights and stuff like that, if they could follow a video. I think there are, there, it's still possible to go outside, I guess, with supervision um, if they're not going to social distance appropriately the risk might be less with biking but maybe that wouldn't be safe necessarily by himself so those are my ideas i don't know pam i know that you and dave really enjoy doing outdoor activities together too do you have any thoughts on this one um yes for this person i um if they're uh trails uh, the trails are not heavily used. And if there were places that he liked to go that you were able to take him, um, then I would suggest maybe you could explore independently, go and check out the trail and see if it's still open and see um, how crowded or not uncrowded it is. Um, in my experience, I still hike and walk trails when I can. And recently I've noticed that they are the ones that are still open are really not being used a lot. So I would encourage you to explore and see if you might find one or two trails where you could take the person or, or even just be able to walk around the block twice a day. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a comment here about um, one of the activities um, that people are doing at home to stay engaged. And um, a patient here is motivated to make face masks and um, she feels she's helping out and is being engaged. Um, and I have heard this from a lot of other caregivers and patients that making face masks at home are a really great way to, um, to stay engaged and also feel like you're helping out your community. Um, so that's great. Um, we have um, another question here about, is there such a thing as too much TV? Um, the news has been pretty upsetting. And do you have any recommendations about how to manage um, how to manage this? Uh, that's a really great point. I think I think that's good, especially you know if you want to keep stress low in the home, maybe limiting how much we watch the news. Maybe we listen to the news with headphones and don't expose the person with cognitive impairment if they're going to perseverate about it. Or yeah, I'm just limiting to do it like once a day for a limited amount of time. And um, I, I think whether or not there's such a thing as too much TV, I think really depends on the person. I think if someone's really apathetic and it's really challenging to get them to do other things that we might try to engage them more with and through the TV. So trying to talk about what's happening on the TV. For example, if you're watching an animal do something cute on the on an animal cam or watching shows, I, I, it seems people have different preferences. So I would explore what people's preferences are and observe what they seem to brighten up with. Um, so one person might want to watch Blue Bloods, the old 
you know, New York cop sitcom and other people might like mash or golf or classic, uh, you know, baseball games on TV. So, so other people, you know, I have one person who watches, um, mass and, you know, religious programming on TV and really engages with that. So, um, I, I think we want to try to keep a balance and, and try to engage different parts of our brain and, and also be gentle with ourselves during this time. I guess that's my best answer. I don't know, Pam. Uh, well, I liked also, Sarah, when you're in your presentation, you mentioned um, old programs. Um, mm -hmm. so, so depending on the age of the person, you know, try to think of or find the classic um, comedy shows or the classic um, adventure shows that were on uh, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s that would bring back memories for them. Was there anything your husband enjoyed watching? Oh, well, the simpler. <laughs> we, we watched Murder, She Wrote a lot. Ah. I think I've seen every episode um, <laughs> many, many times, but it didn't matter because um, he, he liked it and then I would tell him what was happening. So that's the other part of this is just uh, being able to interpret what's happening in a, in a program for, mm -hmm. for your loved one. Yeah, I know someone else who says her dad really enjoys watching Westerns and ninja movies. Mm -hmm. So as long as those things aren't distressing, I think to yeah. you. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the behaviors um, that come with the disease and how might they pose as a barrier to engage in, engaging in activities. So for someone who um, is strongly apathetic and doesn't want to participate in these activities, um, how might caregivers um, encourage them and try to motivate them? Yeah, I think this is a really common challenge. I mentioned apathy and lack of motivation. And so I think one thing is to adjust your expectations and maybe it's a success to get them to stand up and walk to the dining room for a meal. Um, if they're sitting on the couch all day, it can be useful to do things that might be more passive, like listening to music or going for a drive sitting on the porch we might not always be successful in getting people to do activities in the traditional sense some tips um, in terms of getting people to do things i think we'll sometimes ask people if they want to do something do you want to take out the trash and it, it can be people can say no without really meaning no so one way to rephrase this kind of question is to say, can you help me take out the trash and, you know, physically help them or demonstrate what you want them to do. So they might be able to do things or engage in things with a little bit more support. I think it's also important the tone that we use. So sometimes it can take a little bit more enthusiasm and almost a song and dance to get people to do things. So we're not going to be able to do that all the time, but trying to use those more energy demanding strategies some of the time to get the person to be active. And Pam, do you have any other thoughts on that? Um, what you mentioned, um, feeling, be able to feel success if, if your loved one, um, you know, makes it to the dining room or makes it to the kitchen or makes it to the family room to, um, so movement, inside the house and then also being able to sit outside if you have a, a deck or a patio um, maybe have lunch outside so you break up so breakfast is one place lunch is another place and um, uh, dinner might be the same place as the breakfast but um, and then in my case also um, Dave over the years he'd be I had to do more and more coaxing to get him to come out in the afternoon. But once he was in the car, he was totally engaged. I mean, he just really wanted to look around and the dog was with us. And so it, it did take some coaxing and patience and waiting. But then once he was in the car, it was a successful outing. 
I think the other thing, one of the caregivers I was working with the other day said that um, using rewards, which I, I've heard, you know, one woman, she had a hard time getting her husband in the house and he loved grapes. And so she would literally kind of hold up grapes to get him to walk towards her to get back in the house. So I think a reward can be a treat. It can also be, you know, let's do this and then we'll watch your favorite show or let's do this and we can uh, have an ice cream afterward. So th thinking about what the person still likes that might be used to motivate them to do something that they might not otherwise be motivated to do. Great, thank you. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk um, a little bit for the people um, who are going on short walks outside, um, both patients and caregivers, um, what are some good ways to remind people with dementia to practice um, good hand washing techniques or remind them on the social distancing um, practices while they're outside? Yeah, I think people with dementia in general will probably need help to wash their hands appropriately. So washing their hands, your hands with them and giving them verbal cues and showing them what you want them to do and trying to think, you know, anytime before you eat, after you go to the bathroom, when you, before you leave the house, when you come back into the house to wash your hands. In terms of social distancing, one of the tips I heard today from Joanne on our team was the person she works with loves animals and if they see an animal or you know some people love little kids they'll just want to go up to the little kids and interact with them and maybe get closer than they should at this day and age so a when you're walking maybe holding their hand or you know kind of creating a physical barrier and also a tactile cue or a distraction to kind of help you redirect them a little bit more. And then also she thought of the idea of having them do something else, like bring out your camera phone and take a picture or ask if you can take a picture instead um, might be a way to redirect their uh, desire to get into someone's space. I thought that was a great idea to try. Yeah, definitely. Um, and again, if people have um, if people have any questions or comments, um, there is a Q and A box right at the bottom um, of your Zoom screen for you to type in um, any questions or comments you might have. Um, some some questions I've been hearing from um, some caregivers I've been working with are, you know, the day programs might still be operating, but um, at a reduced capacity, um, or they had a companion caregiver who used to come by to the house um, to help their loved one do exercises or activities. Um, and they were wondering about the safety of this. Um, is it still safe to have caregivers come by to the house or to go to a day program, even if it's running, but at a reduced capacity? Yeah, I think those are really valid concerns. I think in terms of going to the day program, I would just want to talk to the organization and make sure they have protocols in place for screening their staff and making sure that their staff, you know, before they come in are, are being screened for symptoms as well as exposure and, you know, having their temperature checked. I would, I would probably also consider what the person's risk factors are, you know, in terms of age and other comorbidities in terms of um, how worried I would be. So if, if they have um, a lung disease or heart disease, I, I might be more cautious than I, than I would for someone who is otherwise healthy. And in terms of having people come in the home, the CDC has really good guidance. And unfortunately, you know, the demands for protective equipment like masks and gloves and and gowns are are really needed to be used for those on the the front lines of working with really really sick people so in the home care sector we we don't have access to the same level of protective equipment i think you still want to follow the same guidance in terms of screening people for exposure and symptoms and 
encourage hand washing when immediately when someone comes into your house and probably a face mask if if they're not going to be able to um, observe social distancing obviously when helping provide care so I, I guess you know following the guidance from the CDC and the and I think San Francisco Public Health Department has also really good guidance around these um, concerns. I would also say, you know, for people, I think taking someone shopping with dementia, that's an area where it's going to be probably harder to uh, keep them from doing things that might put them more at risk. And there are, you know, different communities are pulling together to identify volunteers who can help people who are at higher risk to to pick up groceries for people if someone doesn't have family that's available to do that. So next week, uh, the topic is uh, resources and, and that'll certainly be covered then. Um, but 211 or the information line or the Alzheimer's Association hotline might also be ways to identify those kinds of resources locally to avoid um, exposing people. Great, thank you. Um, and it looks like we have um, we have no more questions coming in. So I was wondering, Sarah and Pam, if you have any closing comments or um, anything else you might want to add for our listeners. I guess I'm just really grateful to families and caregivers in particular for caring for the people they're stuck at home with and trying to make the best of it. And I'm really proud of living in the Bay Area and I'm, I'm really proud of, of everyone doing their best to stay at home to, to protect people. Um, so I did just see another question, I think here, um, that's asking about how to help someone in the late stages who's now bedridden. So let's see. It looks like she's playing calming music and sitting with him and doing brief conversations. And so I'm not sure. Oh, she's asking for suggestions. It sounds like you're doing a lot of what I would recommend. I think um, be, being with someone, touch something like a hand massage or a foot massage. They say that people um, can hear even when they they may not be responding expressively. And, and so going through pictures, talking about memories. Um, I'm, I'm really feeling for you being with someone in this, in this stage when, when we can't have visitors, because I think this is also a nice time to be able to remember people with others. So I would encourage you to talk to people who know your spouse and um, talk about him and, and what you're experiencing and with, with others as well. Pam, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Um, well, just that, uh, and you may have said this, Sarah, is, is that music, music um, is uh, a great um, communicator at that stage. Yeah, I think, I think of the senses. So music, touch, tactile things, if they have repetitive motion with their hands, something to touch or hold. Yeah, um, and and I think yeah. talking with talking with others is is also for the for the caregiver and not just for the for the person who might not comprehend. Um, so so whatever is useful for you as as well. Um, a lot of a lot of people have um, spiritual practices, so that that's something that. Um, can play an important role at end of life, and um, but not for everyone. So, 
Great. Well, thank you, ladies, for taking up the time today um, to share your wisdom with us. Um, and thanks to everyone um, who tuned in for this webinar today. Um, we hope you'll join us next week for our webinar on finding resources. Um, in the meantime, um, take care, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you.